Welcome to Season 3 of Conscious Conversations, where we aim to inspire deep and meaningful interactions that grow into a community of practice that is committed to healing, resilience and expansion. Today we're having a Conscious Conversation with Greg McNeil and we are talking about African indigeneity and sovereignty. I think many of us know about our history with colonization. We know, um, I don't think we know what we don't know about our, our history as African people and people of African descent. And so in seeking to have a deep understanding um, of indigenous, black identities, human and non-human, one cannot help but think about the ramifications and intersections of anti-black racism, slavery, gender inequality, colonialism, erasure of our history, fractured identities, land dispossession and violence. And these issues are entangled with our spiritual, social and political and economic embodiments and the structures of the lives of black people on the African continent and the African diaspora, and are connected to one sense of place and displacement, appropriation and recovery, othering and belonging. While indigeneity in Africa and the Americas may be contested in different ways, the historical patterns of settler colonialism, cultural assimilation, identification of ancestral homelands, and intensifying globalization add to the complexity of one's indigenous status. In this conversation, Greg and I hopefully can explore the ways in which we can think about these matters beyond uh, the transatlantic slave era and uh, beyond arrival, because as we know, our history um, is very complex. And so, Greg, please share with us a bit about your background, uh, where you are at, what got you interested um, in the work that you do. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's just start with the place that I'm currently at, right? So... I'm in the United States, the southwestern part of the United States. I am in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I'm in the uh, Rocky Mountain areas of the uh, country. Um, I am currently um, in my uh, doctoral program, right? I'm in the candidate status. So I have just about a year before I'm complete. And so I'm really excited about that. And, uh, and that's where my uh, dissertation is focused on African indigeneity, and specifically within the United States. I am in a private practice. I have been a licensed clinical counselor for nearly 20 years here in the state of New Mexico. I diagnose and treat various types of psychological dis-ease, right? Um, I'm a clinical director, business owner, life coach, you know, servant researcher. Um, there's probably a lot of things that are going on for me that I'm into, and I can see that that list continues to grow. So I may forget some things, but I would like to say at the at the heart, um, an adventurer, right? The work, being called to this work, um, you know, I talked about it some in the research, you know, from dreams, visions, um, I've always been connected and have knowledge of my uh, indigeneity that I learned, of course, from my parents. And so it sort of um, set me on a little bit of a different course, right? So I was a little bit at odds with the re rest of the educational format that a lot of the people around me, you know, were receiving. And, um, you know, as a young person, you know, you had to kind of like deal with that split brain type of thing, what you're hearing in one environment versus what you're getting in your primary environment. So I really paid attention to that. But I would grow and, uh, like I said, you know, like esoteric studies, ancient history, 
religion, all of those things would become a part of my path on this journey as a transdisciplinary scholar because it would be the ways that I could help figure out the riddles that as African people, African descended people that we've been challenged with. And so that's been my journey to this point, right? And if something pops into my head as we go forward, I'll quickly jump in and say, oh yeah, this is something else that I used to do. (laughs) Okay. Uh. And um, your your journey, I mean, you and I have had other conversations uh, before around uh, you growing up. I know your your mom in, in particular was very instrumental in helping you maintain your identity. And I think your relationship with the environment, with nature, which you still have a very strong connection with, how did that affect you growing up as a young boy in America? Wow. So that's really interesting because um, I was considered a country boy. Right. I was considered a country boy when I was in the country, which if, if you can get that, you know, how can you be considered a country boy when everybody's in the country? Well, that's how far off I was. Um, I was never comfortable any place as I was in the forest. Right. I didn't since we really live very close to it. You know, you know, parents and children, when we have great relationships, when they're talking to you, they become your best storytellers. And as I listen to my mom and, you know, family members talk about, you know, African history, your indigeneity and these types of things, there was really no place I could go outside of my house and have conversation with because it just wasn't in the community that way. So... Instead, I went out the back door. I was in the forest. That's where I was. I I stayed there. That was my community for many, many years. And even growing up through school, there was always a part of me that I could engage in any conversation that most people engaged in. But there was always a part of me that was attached to another place. And, you know, that's, you know, nature, the natural environment, you know, keeping the ears open for the calls, the voices, I guess you could say that children hear that uh, adults tend to lose. Yeah. So that's what it was like for me. Why? I mean, so America or the United States has a very interesting relationship um, with uh, people of African descent. Um, And I know, you know, from what we see on TV, what we see in, in, in the media, I, I know that it's been very difficult for black people or people of color to maintain who they are. Why do you think or, or how do you think it is that your mom still stayed strong in her knowing and therefore was able to nurture you and your gift? Okay, so when we're talking about the United States in particular... Um, so when we use the term colonization, um, we think about it in some places globally. Um, but when you think about the United States, there is an intensity, um, in the United States with that whole process. And, you know, we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, especially as I go deeper to the research, but there is a great deal of intensity. And unfortunately, what you see in this country, the strength in many cases is carried in our mothers. Um, Because in some cases, they've been the only ones that have been allowed to have a voice. And, uh, And when I say that, that's just not abstract language. There is some intensity behind that. So if you research this history in the United States, you can see there's been quite a, there's a history of intensity in terms of how uh, colonialism has acted towards people of African descent in this country. And so it's always been a challenge. For me, one of the things that I came to learn 
that it really has nothing to do with the color of your skin. The color of the skin becomes a marker. It becomes something that you can easily identify. You can say, look, there's that person with that particular skin color. But it's the history. It is the history of the African people in this country, um, pre-colonial times. And of course, throughout Europe, that really tells the story of the intensity that you see in the Americas and, of course, across the globe. But the I guess you could say the, the Academy Award for Colonialism um, appears to be uh, won by the United States right now. <laughs> And unfortunately, they seem to set the pace for other nations. I mean, I look at South Africa, for instance. Um, so many uh, young black people seem to gravitate towards the trend that are set in America, you know. Uh, so even from an identity perspective, um, yeah, there, there's this. Like people want to be American. People feel like they, they need to assimilate to a particular culture, um, which is really sad because I think a lot of the, um, um, the breakdown of identity and a sense of self-worth is very prevalent in the United States among um, people of color and um African people or, 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 or people of African descent, you know, we see it in, in how people just live, the things that they value. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's quite a lot. But I want to speak to you about what indigeneity means, because as a concept in research, it's become very popular in recent years. Um, what, what is indigeneity and how different is it from the word native you know because with how i've come to understand indigeneity it sort of like put put as some of us so for example my maternal grandparents are from lesotho right um my grandmother's mother is from botswana which is a neighboring country here so when we speak about being an indigenous person I'm not particularly indigenous to South Africa. So how do we speak about these, these, these terms? What, what is the difference? So one of the things that is really important, um, really for everyone, but if we're talking about, you know, like African descended people and African people in general, we're start talking about indigeneity. Well, let us, to clear it up, let us first go back to antiquity. Okay. So Oxford likes to give us a standard dic dictionary definition, which is individuals, people who have inhabited the lands from the earliest times and before the time of colonists arrival, right? Right now, you can include um, essentially all of the indigenous people on the planet in that definition. Okay. Um, more specifically, you can say that you're talking about African people because African people, again, now we're talking about evidence, not facts, mm -hmm. not beliefs, but evidence. And the evidence um, clearly indicates that the first homo sapien sapiens anywhere, okay, they were started in Africa, and then they migrated out to other places across the globe, mm -hmm. which meant that wherever they went, they were the first peoples. Now, in my research, I stayed away from the word aboriginal at that point because I thought, you know what, I'll come, I'll hit that at, at, a, at a later time. But what I wanted to get clearly established in the people's minds is, so we take this, this definition. Well, the first peoples before um, from the earliest times, are African people, okay? It's in the bone, so we don't have to worry about arguing about that. And we're not only just talking about on the continent of Africa, but we're also talking about in ancient America. And also, too, for the listener, it's important to understand that what we know 
today as Africa and all of the different countries that make up the continent, it was just one place, you know, in antiquity. It was just one place with many people on it, right? So when we talk about when we move to native, now we're, when we get to native, now we're starting to get, we're moving closer into, uh, I guess you could say European history now, right? When we say, what's this idea of native? Well, you're native to the land that you were either born to or associated with. Okay, well then, if you consider what migration has done, then who is native anywhere first before African people? Okay. Now, this is not finger pointing. Nobody is grandstanding. And this is what makes this research so important. In order for us to keep it at the level where we can heal, we want to be able to stick with evidence, right? So that way, um, we stay out of ego, language, false trappings, and these types of things. And we just say, well, look, no, this is who we are. This is where we come from. We have always been here. And that's the evidence. So again, so we kind of go back to the idea of indigeneity, or first and foremost, we were already here. We were here before the colonists arrived, and there were many different African people who were living in many different places, okay? And it's only until the time of colonization that we realize that this country is called one thing and your neighbor's community is called something else, right? Typically, um, you would say that the land itself created its natural boundaries. And the people, when they met each other, they all communicated, you know, during a time of um, harmony and we connected and we grew as a people and that's what happened. And if I forgot something, please, you know, direct me back because, you know, just in case I didn't quite, you know, answer that all. I, I love the fact that you, you brought in antiquity, right? Because research does say um, the first humans migrated out of Africa at least two million years ago. Um, so the conversation about indigeneity, ancestry, lands landlessness for the globe becomes very interesting then. Why do you think governments um, of the world essentially ignore this fact? So now, so I'm going to go with the evidence and then I'll probably make a little bit of a leap. So I'll be as clear and um, and respectful as, as possible. So when you get into the research, when you get into the evidence, you find out that people around the globe um, research, they all know what you and I are talking about. African indigenous history, populating the world and stuff like this is is not new. So I believe it is um, uh, Sir uh, Godfrey Higgins, you know, a famous uh, British historian back in, I want to say, 18... I want to say 1850, maybe 1860. And he reports whenever, excuse me, whenever we search for the origins of humanity, they are always black. The deities are always black, like they have been from the earliest times. The further you go back, the blacker the soil becomes. Again, none of this is it's not new to those people who know it. The people who need to know it do not. And that has been the challenge. So the question becomes, um, you know, what has happened? Well, I would say that if you know your history, you act differently in the way that you live. If you do not know your history and you're constantly on shifting sands, you can be told anything and redirect it to wherever someone wants to take you. And the other thing that is, I, I don't know if it's obvious to everyone, but when you look at places where indigenous people live, they are 
self-sustaining continent, right? Resource dense. And wherever that is, is where you see colonization um, really in trend, right? It's a, it's an extraction principle. It's a dependency principle in that process. So when I look at it, uh, um, and I, I don't want to get off too far, but when we start talking about land and indigeneity, we are also talking about people who had everything that they needed. Okay. We, poverty as we know it today did not exist. So when we start really getting into that, right, you can actually see what's happening. Not only did they know that African people had populated the globe, that they were indigenous everywhere that they went, they also knew that they were builders, they were pyramid builders and civilization builders. And again, these are the types of things that I seek to do in my research, which is say, hey, look, when you understand this, we can start to think differently. Because right now you've been challenged with another thought form, and that's why, you know, there are the challenges that we face right now. I hope I answered that for you good. I like the fact that you're, you're bringing um, civilizations that have gone past, right? Because, as you know, I'm also um, pursuing a PhD, you know, um, and it is currently titled The Desecration of the Bantu with the focus on the Ndu, a case for healing ancestral trauma. And for me, this work has meant going back and uh, because I've also been initiated um, as a Sangwoma. So I feel very much called um, to understand who I am because I, I don't think one can do justice to this work and to healing and to personal decolonization when one does not understand who they are and where they come from. So I, I sort of like looked at the history of civilizations and I saw that um, Africa was rich, man. We had kingdoms. We like. So why do you think that part of history is not told? I mean, as a young person, um, up until this point, the history I knew of Africa was pre-slavery, pre, I mean, uh, post-slavery um, and post-apartheid, right? And what I'm finding out now is that we were rich, we were amazing traders, we were economists, we did so much. Why is it that that is not told and why do you think African people or people of African descent have not had a very focused interest in rediscovering that history or actually teaching us the correct history. I mean, I look at the political climate here, the political leaders, I don't even want to call them leaders because like what they're doing is just so wrong. Like people are so captured. Um, it is shocking. It's actually painful to see how people with the same pigmentation, with the same marker, do not seem to understand the importance of really, really understanding who we are because it changes how we think about ourselves. I mean, I look at my process, like coming to understand these things has really changed how I look at life, how I position myself, what I think I'm capable of. Um, yeah, so it just changes so much. But it's very interesting. I think it would be very interesting to find out from you as to why that history has not been told um, as it actually happened, you know? Yeah. So one of the things about my research is I seek to take that obscure hidden history and make sure that it is embodied. Okay, because one of the things for me um, on this path is like I've been, uh, I would say, called to like the hidden thing. It's like there's something that's not being expressed, but it's very much alive and operating. And it seems like that's what would, 
I would be tuned in to those types of things. So when I would hear somebody say like, you know, we need to find out who we are. When I hear that existential question, my brain essentially says, you have to go back. You actually have to dig because the question implies that something so terrible has happened that nobody really remembers. Now, if we go back to the United States, and let's just say like if the United States in many ways sets the stage in a lot of the programming, the social programming that you see across the world, right? Well, if you look at some of the things that are depicted as having happened in this country, you know, they show some people on a plantation doing things. What you see are spiritless individuals, right? They just, that's what you see. What you don't see is what happened to cause somebody to appear to be spiritless, docile, and all of the other things that have been um, identified through um, slavery and the colonization process. Now, there are some things in the research that I have discovered through other primary research research sources that... Um, that I'm de that's definitely going to be in the work, and obviously you're going to have an opportunity to read it, but I will just say that the intensity of the slavery experience is far greater than what has been publicized, okay? And I think that's one of the things that we really have to kind of like take into the body because if you just read the current texts that are out there or you you read some of the shows that have been sh that they show every now and then they depict the same kind of like process if you've seen one you've seen them all but that's not the history when you when you read what has actually happened and 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 I will admit to the um, to the listeners some of this research that I'm doing right now I'm I'm not sharing in this particular space because it's not ready yet right but I will say that we're talking about something so extraordinarily intense that it is just causing you um, to just have a completely different way of viewing the world. You cannot speak your language. You cannot go anywhere. You can't parent. You can't control anything as it relates to your essence other than die. Okay? And that's just, that's just a small portion of it. So when you think about all of the things that have actually happened in this country, you can actually see how Thoughts have been shaped, how attitudes have been shaped, how behaviors have been shaped. And I would say that a lot of this really stems from not only a lack of knowledge of your history, but you have been um, deliberately separated from your history um, with the type of intensity that most people are just not in prepared to endure, you know, and like I said, I can just, I can really go on into that in terms of like just how we shape thought and which is one of the areas of my research as a clinician, thought really is uh, my work, how thought is intentionally shaped to produce the realities that we currently experience and then how we go in and help to change that. That's really what my work is. <laughs> I, I love that you delved a little bit deeper into your work because thought and the mind are so pivotal in terms of how we experience life, the choices that we make, um, how we perceive our reality. Um, and, you know, I was hoping I'll ask you this later, um, but I think because you, you've touched um, on this, we should, we, should, we should get right into it. I, I, I have read about the hermetic principles and um, the laws of the universe, you know, all these things around how 
the mind actually functions, right? And so with the understanding that civilizations rise and fall, I am wondering if what has also happened to Africa has not been a natural progression of the rise and fall of the natural rhythm of how 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 the universe functions. Um, so so that for me, it's something that I've been toying with in my head to say, is there an opportunity to look at this situation differently without believing ourselves to be the victims in all of this? If we knew that, I mean, there was a time when Greek empires were like super powerful. There was a time when African empires were super powerful. Um, I believe there's a particular emperor emperor, I forgot his name, who is said to have been um, richer than what Bill Gates is right now. Right? Yeah, Mansa Busa. Yes, yes. yes. (laughs) So if that has happened, and I mean, I know in in Europe, um, particularly around the Greek history, they've also had their down times, right? when things were not good. And I suppose maybe that is why they felt they need to colonize as others. Do you think thinking differently about what has happened uh, throughout civilization might help us um, identify less as victims and as um, people this atrocious history has happened to? Um, yeah, so if we think about the 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 rhythm, you know, everything that goes up must come down. Yeah. So I'm a fan of the hermetic principles. Okay. So as soon as I saw that, I started to chuckle. <laughs> so, um, you know, you're talking about the principle of rhythm, right? And I, I took a couple of days to think about that. Um, and when I think about the, the history of, of, uh, you know, the history of the human species on this planet and how long there have been a lot of swings of the pendulum, right? There's been a lot of swings of the pendulum. And I thought about that. And I thought, well, when, when, if I look at the length of human history, I could say that that rhythm has been going for some time. But the more I've thought about it, I see the principle of rhythm really um, in play with colonization and the fracturing of that system. Because that's another thing that I hear quite a bit about, right, is one of the intensity that's happening is that they feel that the world that they constructed is falling apart. Okay. And so when I look at it from that point, I can say, I can see the rhythm of that because I can clearly see the epoch, mm-hmm. right? And um, and starting the world's civilizations, I see that as a little bit different. Um, but I will say this, um, how the self-concept of African people. That self-concept is one that I see as being engineered. And um, there is a lot of, there's a gentleman out in uh, Rosenthal, I think that's his last name. And uh, he coined the term, the Pygmalion effect. Basically, yeah, Pygmalion. And uh, which really um, relates to um, the expectations, let's say like the expectations of those in authority, teachers and so forth, how the expectations, attitudes of those in authority, the, those who are teaching can influence those who are actually learning from them, right? So you kind of go back and look at that just a little bit and then you take it out of the classroom and then you apply it to a broader view. You could say then in many respects, that the African people are living out a Pygmalion effect, right? In which through colonization, you are creating circumstances through which people are having to live through. 
Okay. And I'm going to say more about how that, you know, how I see that, you know, taking place. But let's just say, for instance, if you don't teach African history um, the way it should be taught so that people can, they can feel proud of their, their ancestral history, then you're actually doing something with it, right? And so particularly in this country, you're not getting that history, right? You know, your history starts at, you know, it starts in the 1700s. It starts in Europe, right? That's where they're making your history start at. And so they're basically telling you that everything that happened after that is not only inconsequential, but now they're trying to, they're trying to uh, Europeanize um, ancient African history. So, and that's just not true. You just, they can only go this far and then that's it, right? You know, and that's in the bones, right? So, but if you don't know your history because of all of the things that we mentioned earlier that's happened to you, then suddenly you're being fed something else. And the diet that you're being fed in terms of history and the world in which you live in, it's not nutritious. It throws you off. It's unsettling. It's a stress dynamic. Uh, um, so you can then, when people are in those states, they're much more easy to manipulate, you know, and, uh, and experience victimhood, right? And so some of that is also engineered. So this is why there are so many of us, you know, Dr. David Hotep, Van Sertima, Diop, uh, Winters, um, all of the people who have actually come before, this is one of, and I'm in that line too now, I guess you could say, that this work is about removing the veil that makes your existence feel so unsettled, okay? And this is what a lot of people are dealing with, right? That when they reach for the thing that is really important to them, it feels unsettled. And uh, and if I could just say this really quickly, uh, yesterday I was on a, a webinar um, titled Deconstructing Anxiety and Fear. And in the, in the webinar, we talked about the five core fears. Well, abandonment, of course, loss of love was number one. But number two is identity. Not the identity that we like to call ourselves, not the made up identity like I identify as this type of a person. I'm talking about who you are, right? Who you are as a person. That, the loss of that creates a core fear. It creates an existential crisis for us, right? And so people in the United States, many of them don't realize that they're the same people. They, you know, when you get down to the, our blood, they, we are the exact same people, right? We have always been the same people. But the trauma, and here's just a little bit, and um, do you remember the movie called Roots? It was a long time ago. <laughs> you hadn't seen it? Yeah, there we go. Well, there you go. So I would actually encourage you not to even go back and look at it then, right? Because it's, because... You don't need to, but there is a scene in that series where one of the actors, um, I want to say his name is Ben Vereen. He played the part called Kunta Kinte, right, in this scene. And he had tried to run away. He's being, you know, he's being whipped and everything like this. And that gentleman is saying, what is your name? As he applying all of these lashes. And the gentleman is saying his African identity name. And he keeps saying it and he keeps saying it. But the the lashes of the whips just keep on coming, right? And they keep on coming until he finally says, my name is Toby. Well, what a lot of people misunderstood in that scene was that uh, African connection to the indigeneity in the United States was broken. 
because at that point they started speaking English. There was nobody in here speaking English before the, the European arrived. But when you don't really have your history and you don't really know it, you miss those parts. So what happens, it becomes fragmented. And when things, when your knowledge is fragmented, people can easily slide in something into its place. And when they have the power to do so, they can put this um, construct, they can upload this construct into your psyche, into your subconscious, start repeating it. And then before you know it, you start to believe um, those things which are not true. Um, I love that you bring in the issue of language, right, into this whole conversation because, um, you know, the past two years, like over the past two years, I feel like my healing process and my decolonization is just being fast-tracked. And I've been um, going back and looking at some of our um, sayings, like just like our language and how often in the ways in which our elders would speak, there would be so much wisdom in all of that. Um, it might sound like a proverb, but it was so practical to their everyday life and how they exist with nature, you know, um, yeah, so I totally understand how the loss of language has been so um, has has been key in disconnecting us from who we are. And now looking looking at 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 myself, even as a thirty five year old, it makes me sad that I do not know how to speak Sesotho, which is my mother tongue, the way I'm supposed to know it. Because I recognize the depth in my actual existence that just having that could have given me. Um, yeah, it, so they did a pretty good damn job, right? They really knew what they were doing. Yes. I mean, if I can, if I can jump in on this, it's like language and consciousness are in relationship. Your consciousness is expressed through language. You express your, through language, you express your consciousness, what you all about, what you are thinking, right? When you are, when, when you and I are having a conversation and we've had many conversations, when we're in that space, we don't have English constructs. We're just talking. And then we get to a point after a while where, you know, like you can feel it in your body. And it's like, um, we need new language, right? Because this language that has been substituted, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And and for me, it is one of the things that I'm a big advocate of. It's like, look, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're not speaking the same language. We're saying the same words. But we do not mean the same thing because your words are constantly changing, right? So you use one of the words I wrote, I underlined was othering. I'm kind of like jumping a little bit, right? But it's like othering. How many other words have there been in the English language that kind of like represent that, right? But when you think of your language, when you think of Ubuntu, when you are saying something in your language. It's the same word. It's been the same word for for a millennia. We're not changing that language because it means the same thing. And when it means the same thing, everybody in the community now has a certain type of consciousness. Within the United States, as you will find out, it's like, look how many words we have. Every time you turn around, the language is changing. So I so for me personally, I was like, look, this is this is just my approach. I get it. I'll take that language and I'll put it over here. Right. So I know how to use it when I'm speaking to certain people. But I regularly have sort of like a data drop in my head about taking in too many what I want to call English words that are abstractions and they keep you disconnected from what you need to be feeling and thinking and expressing. 
as we are talking, um, Greg, the issue of sound and word are coming to my awareness. Um, now, if we understand what sound is in the context of creation, then language becomes very important, doesn't it? It is. And and that's one of the reasons why tongues were cut out. Okay. People are boiled and other kinds of atrocities that you can think of because we have to disconnect you from that consciousness. Because what the evidence shows when your consciousness is intact, what is it that you cannot do? Okay. What is it? Absolutely nothing. So um, when people say, well, what is the biggest difference? And if you're not careful, they will try to disconnect people in, the, in, the, in America from people in Africa. If you don't understand what's happening, they will try to disconnect you from, from that. Well, their consciousness is different. Well, sure it is. But why? Because if you look at the population density, then you understand what happened to the community. So just imagine you have to deal with the continent of Africa very differently because of the populations of peoples than you do in the United States where you might only, you know, um, e imagine that you have, for every 100 Europeans, you have three Africans. So you can you can see how um, curated and cold, right, the population in this country is. Their education, how they've been directed and disconnected and fragmented, right? But when we have these kinds of conversations and then they get, they re, they're getting beyond what I call like that colonizing framework, all of a sudden you begin to recognize that you are always connected. Right. I mean, it's like, so here we are. This thing that's happening right now was something that was forbidden back then. Right. Right. You just can't talk because if you could talk and understand each other, then that means that you can do things. You can do the things that you've always done and we can't let you do what you've always done. And that's what the people do not know about their history that they need to know. Well, I mean, yeah, um, a, a part of me, because I'm such a soft person, I'm <laughs> so I'm just wondering what kind of human being must you be to orchestrate something like this? But anyway, now when we talk about <laughs> when we talk about colonization and um, and how we as as African people, perhaps as people of African descent, um, particularly here in in Africa, and you can you can expand on what the situation is like in the United States and maybe other parts of America or, or the Americas where people of color have been colonized. I know, um, you know, like in in South America, there's still a, a rich heritage you know and it seems like the rest of the world is now starting to appreciate indigenous cultural practices spirituality and so on but again it's being commercialized so um just you know the the, the gravitas and um you know the sacredness of it is sort of like being diluted but how are we complicit in the colonization of indigenous people. So in the case of the Khoisan, which here in South Africa, they still have to fight to be recognized. They still have to fight for basic things, you know? And some of, like I've seen certain communities still prefer to live how they were living before... Um, colonization happened or before people started moving the way that they move. I know some Khoisan communities still choose to live 
how their ancestors have lived, but they keep on being pushed out of their land. Um, um, I had a conversation with Simon um, Vitboy, um, who who is a Khoisan uh, man healer, and you know how he speaks about what is happening in the world. Um, just also broke my heart because he, one of the things he said is, we as an elder, so we're not, and I'm paraphrasing, we're not going to throw tantrums when children are throwing tantrums. Um, and he speaks about love and he speaks about them maintaining their identity despite what is happening. But another aspect to this whole thing is how um, descendants of the, the Khoisan want, actually, he said they want nothing to do with it because the younger generation recall how their ancestors were treated for being who they are. So there's almost this sense of self-hate or not wanting to identify as Khoisan. Uh, and I'm just going to use them as an example, but but I know, like even amongst the Zulus, among the Basutus, I mean, just how we how people consume, how we carry ourselves, what we consume is so Western that for me it feels like we are a people that have come to loathe themselves. Yes. Yeah, so again, I use the term Pygmalion. Right, and I talked about Rosenthal, something, and you want to really look up, right? Because I'm going to talk about that quite a bit in the next stage of of my research, right? Because that's a program, okay? So what you're actually talking about really is a program, right? And you know, as a clinician, I'm it's just one of those things I'm just very much aware of. You know, you just see this all the time, so. You have to do things to people to get them to think and behave a certain way. That's the first thing that we're talking about, right? So before people can act a certain way, we have to look at what is the cause. So we see the effect, right? We see the effect of colonization, right? But the cause is obscured. Because nowadays, you just see a lot of commercialism and things like that. So again, a lot of it is you're looking at it down the road. But in the case of, like you said, like the, the Khoisan right there, you know, um, the elders and then the younger people are like, look, you know, we don't want that. Well, that is a, that is the part of colonization that has been so devastating to every indigenous community on the planet. Okay. Without exception. Um, you go places you don't expect to see people and somebody has got an American football jersey on. So how did you get that out here? Right. So, um, and that's something that I'm going to talk about, you know, like more so in my research, but I want to, I want to make this part clear. Something has happened, and that's what we're really talking about. And when we put it in the body, then we can really say, now I understand what's happening. This is why these people are doing this, right? It's like, I I don't want my ancient connection. Why is that? Because somebody has made me hate it, okay? We could also be talking about religion, right? You know, the the, the spiritual practices that have gone on across the globe. And what has happened to them as a result of colonization, right? You can see, I mean, I was speaking to Pindi um, not long ago, and we're talking about what religion has actually done to spirituality in all of these African communities, but not just in Africa, but in other continents where indigenous people have been practicing their own um, ways of being. I'm here in the United States in the Southwest. I see it all the time on the Navajo Nation. Right. And other um, uh, American Indian, you know, communities. And every time I see a cross in the community, um, 
I know what's happened to that community. You know, a lot of people don't understand that no indigenous group anywhere in the world ever gave up their practices. They were destroyed, okay, along with the lives of those leaders. So for me, one of the things that I want to do going forward, Babato, is to help people to realize what has happened. Um, we have to stay connected to what's happened, not being victimized, but remembering. By remembering what has happened, then we can come back and say, hey, look, we understand what's going on in the world, but there are some things that we need to do to be able to sustain ourselves. So there may be certain things that you and I say um, to each other. We might have a language that we're using. That language is not leaving our community. Because one of the things that we found out is when that language leaves your community, somebody is manipulating it, right? And so my work for kids, it's not what is wrong, but what has happened. And it is intense what has happened. And I think, you know, for me, it's like, let's just say this hurts what has happened as a result of what we have given to the world. This has been reflected back to us. It is it is painful. OK, so let's acknowledge the pain and then let's take the steps to move forward. And how do we do that? We're doing it right now. Right. We're talking about the history. Any African descended person that's on this podcast right now, no matter where you are in the world, you know, you want to go and look into your history. Right. Go deep into your history. Um, and those are the kinds of things that I think needs to happen to change the consciousness, because that's what we are talking about first. Right. We have to regain control over African consciousness. Right. And um, it, can't, it can't come from someone else that came after you. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of the time when one is speaking about these things, it might sound like one is being political or one is trying to rehash history um, and all these things that other, others might think. But I cannot help. So I, I need to make a disclaimer. So as as a person who has been, I I I don't prefer to to call myself a healer. Although I've been initiated into certain practices, and my relationship with God and my ancestors um, have taught me certain things that have helped me help others recognize what they needed to do to heal. So I'll, I almost don't think of myself as a healer, but because of my journey, um, the experiences that I've had and um, what I've come to understand have enabled me to bring to the fore, to the surface, certain information or insights, wisdoms that can help other people facilitate their own healing, right? So I, I think of myself as like a, a conduit, but for the purpose of this discussion, I'll say as a healer, um, I know that my work is for all of humanity because I think we share a common wound, right? However, I do feel very passionately about the issue of African people. And so can one think about these issues without them being made political? Um yeah, I've I've got a couple of white friends, and one of them, when I posted something on my social media, he said, um, uh, "I'm just supposed to be a healer." The certain things that you say are divisive, and I said, "Well, I don't think people can actually heal unless we understand what has happened, and maybe uh, people who consider themselves as white they need to reconsider why they believe themselves to be white." Because the whole racial um, coloring did not come from us. Um, people who consider themselves to be white have benefited from being looked at as white. Now, as a black person who did not give herself the identity of being black, right? And maybe our ancestors thought of themselves as just human beings. But when anti 
uh, black racism started, then this whole racial thing began. So we are here. We cannot go back. We need to address what has happened, particularly to black people. I acknowledge that all of humanity is deeply wounded, but there is a very deep injustice that has happened to black people and perhaps other people of color. But I cannot speak for them because I don't know their story. I know what has happened to me. I know what has happened to my family. I know what has happened to the Basotho people. Because you go to Lesotho, it's not the same. Men have had to leave their homelands to come to Johannesburg to work in the mines and leave their families. And they've often brought AIDS or taken AIDS home, right? And so children have been left parentless because of the issue of colonization, because of the issue of civilization. So, yeah, my my bias, the intimate relationship I have with my people should be very clear. Whilst I know that the bigger calling is for humanity. So can one speak about these issues without them being politicized or without it being political and is society actually ready to honestly have these conversations because I feel like we cannot heal what we do not acknowledge you know um, yeah um, so the answer to the question from my end is this that as people in the spaces that we are you know like as researchers um, uh, healers, those people, educators, elders in the roles that we are. It is absolutely possible that we can do this work and not make it political. But the system of which we are all a part has made it such that all things that are separate from the narrative is being political, Right. So, um, if we talk about the first inhabitants of the Americas, and you know, you can have some Native Amer, uh, excuse me, American Indians who could be upset by that, and I recognize it. So, in my research, I stick with the evidence, but even with the evidence, some people may still want to make it political. I'm not in charge of that, right? So when I was called to this space, one of the things that was a challenge is because of that, right? That you're going to get this whole brew and all of that other kind of stuff. But that is distraction. That is fear, right? And it is also a way of keeping you away from doing what needs to be done. We can, we can be loving, but but we see the history of the world. We're now living that history. If you and I are not doing the things that we are doing, who tells the story? Who connects them with the history? I mean, I'm looking at that, you know, like you turn on the television and they're trying to show you something, some movie that happened in history. And now the guy's European, right? If you don't keep fighting for your history, they'll make the in- entire history of humanity European. Now, I'm obviously not talking about every European on the planet. Of course I'm not. I'm not even going down that direction. But we understand right now that those who are um, who are perpetuating what we call a colonial experience, anytime you do something other than the narrative, it has to be political because we have to shut it down. Right. So there may be some people who like the friend that you had. Um, It can sell political to him because it is pro-African. But pro-African is not anti anyone. Okay, And so that's one of the things that, you know, think people have to understand. It's like, look, I love you. You're my homeboy and all this other kind of stuff. But when it comes to my people, this is what I have to do. Right. But, <laughs> you know, it's like, I just have to be able to do this. And I've had people to say, look, man, you know, 
that's kind of scary. It's like, no, what's scary is what you don't know, right? Because every time you turn on the program, you turn on your, your, your computer, you are getting a colonial experience. Yep. You, your mind is being conditioned. So what you and I are saying in this healing space, this is what we are required to do and others in this, in this work. But this is not anti-anything. So I think that we can, we can, in our hearts, say, um, I acknowledge that you can feel this way. Um, that is not my feeling. That's not my intent. Um, so if we're not going to speak anymore, I guess we're not going to speak anymore. That was a, in my edit, I was like, you know what? If I cannot speak my truth, if my truth offends you, then we're cool. I love you. I yeah. love you as a friend. But if I cannot speak my truth because it offends you, then we're cool. It's okay. Yeah, because we need for us to not be friends anymore. That Exactly. Because if we, so we've moved into a space in the world where we actively talk about decolonizing we use that language. We say, well, we want to decolonize. If you want to help in decolonizing anything, then helping to restore African history is the start because you came to be through African history, right? Again, that's not a political statement. That is a research statement. That is an evidence-based statement, right? You don't have a European without an African. You don't have a Chinese person without an African, right? You don't have a Native American, American Indian without an African. That's not me. That's the evidence and the research, okay? No, this is the part of colonization that is really pain. You didn't just colonize indigenous people on the planet, but you colonized the minds of your own people. And you've taught your own people to think a certain way, to believe a certain way, and to even in their own minds accept the normalization of attacking, killing, and terrorizing African people. So, you know, colonization is a thing that has a, a, a big blanket that spreads far and wide. And because it does affect everyone, I have sensitivity in my heart for everyone that is affected by this system. But at the same time, I'm going to tell my son, my son's son, my son's son, son's son, right? This is your history. This is what you need to know, right? And if you don't know that, for me, I'm saying you've already lost. You can become, you can overcome anything if you, if your roots are deep in the ground. Yeah, and I think this issue of identity goes beyond race. It goes beyond um, so many things because at its core, it speaks to who we are in relationship to creation, doesn't it, Greg? And once you know that, you one one almost has a completely different sense of what reality is and what becomes possible for you because our ancestors understood the loss of the universe, these hermetic principles, all these things that we now understand in the context of the Greek mythology, right? We understood that. And therefore, we also understood the importance of relating with care, right? Uh, we understood the importance of Respecting life, right? And of course, that meant having a completely different and positive and beautiful human experience. I don't mean to romanticize being African, but what I have come to understand about what Ndu is in this philosophy that now the whole world claims to know about Ubuntu. They know absolutely nothing about, well, most of them, they don't. 
Because Ubuntu is a way of life. It's a philosophy. It is a way of being. That recognizes that there is a spirit in you that I need to honor. There is a spirit in the trees that we need to honor, in the animals, in the rivers, in the mountains. And that is why our people held these sites as sacred. Now, because we've lost even that basic understanding, we have lost our connection with the earth. Now we see this climate chaos and we wonder why. You know, and in, in here in South Africa, I mean, you should see our rivers. Shocking. But that is because people do not understand how they relate to nature, which is clear in the philosophy of Ubuntu, because everything is recognized to have an Ntu, even this table, right? So it's a way of existing that values all of life. It's not just a racial issue. It's not a political thing. It is our birthright. Yes. And again, we called ourselves the name of the land from which we came. That's how you were identified. You are identified with the land, right? Um, so, what you know, what I see in in this situation here is like, you should be proud of who you are as an African person, um, as an indigenous African person with an unbroken lineage. And this is one of the things that, you know, like my neighbor across the street, you know, we're just joking, but, but he would be one of those individuals um, that in conversation like this, you ask him a simple question and you can see how colonization, colonization has broken him. So, for instance, a simple question like, what other person can make an African person besides an African person? Where else did you come from? But certain things like that is, is not in the mind, right? Because those things have been broken. So when you talk about looking, you know, like in certain communities and you look at the rivers or what's happened, what you're looking at is what has been broken. The, the relationship to the land has been broken, right? So the people live now very differently than they lived um, before colonization. So that's one of those things. When I, when I look, right, I always make sure that I keep my mind on the context. So I see a bunch of people living together, you know, the poverty and all of this kind of stuff. And the first thing my mind says is, this is not how the people live. This is a construction, okay? And so when you make people live unnaturally, then the environment where the people live is going to also be reflected in that. But if you don't understand how the system works, you put the blame on the people and not the cause. Mm. You see what I'm saying? And that's one of the things, what I mean when I say we have to stay embodied because if we allow ourselves to keep reaching for these abstract words and those abstract languages, we'll be applying European concepts to an African dynamic that has been severely disrupted. And that's why it never makes sense because you can't use European principles, let's just say, or thinking to go in there saying, this is how we're going to fix your community. No, you actually have to restore the people in the community and then the people will restore their community, right? But what you're doing right now is you think you can bring something outside into this community and fix it. It's like, no, you can't because every time you bring something inside, it's something else that's abstract. It's, it's not the people themselves. You're taking away from that. So again, I don't like to see it. No matter where I go in the world, I don't like to see it. But when I do... I have a lens for what I'm looking at. I know how it came to be because that's not what the world looked like. You know, I'm here in the, the United States in the Southwest. I'm looking at the, the reservations around me. 
their dry desert poverty. The Navajo Nation, for instance, is one of the, I think in terms of natural resources, is probably one of the richest resource dense places in North America. And yet the people live in poverty and the United States government right now are telling them that even though the uh, the Colorado River runs right through the uh, Navajo Nation, you still cannot draw water from it because we have to go back and check all of these treaties. Again, when you understand how the game is played, you could understand what's happening to the people. And that's why my research had to take a different focus because it's like if I start saying what's wrong, I missed a point. I have to go in and address what has happened, you know. And sometimes addressing what's happening means that we do have to go in and pick up the victimization because that has been lost. We, you know, Dr. Clark said that that you lost your victimship, right? And which means that the world then has been normalized in treating you a certain way. That's just propaganda and narrative. So we understand that that's what we're dealing with. And it's like, okay, let them keep doing what they're doing. And you and I will keep having conscious conversations that spread out. Yeah. Ah, Greg, I wish I wish we had more time. We need a we we need a workshop series because <laughs> there's just so much we to speak about. I think that's coming. I think I, I think that's coming probably sooner than I realize. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, um, Greg, for your time. Um, one thing though, what? can we look forward to because I believe spirit is working it is not by chance that we are having this conversation and so because we also understand how the mind works the fact that what you focus on expands we want to move forward right Uh, we understand what has happened and we're going to help our people understand what has happened right Um, but what is our outlook for the future. So now some of this I don't want to give away, right? But I'll just say this. I think an outlook has to be um, a robust education program. You know, some people say, well, you know, like, what's the importance of history? What you don't know hurts you, right? And, uh, and I think there's, and, and I'm talking about the type of education that occurs like you and I are ed- educating with each other, right? You know, like children in the village, you know, working with children here in the United States. So we're all learning and being educated because that's, to me, that's the outlook, right? First, we have to reconnect them, right? We have to reconnect their histories, um, re- reestablish that connection that umbilicus to the placenta right that's what we're that's what we're doing that's what i see in terms of the outlook you know making sure that everybody's connected so no matter where they go when they look at one another they know what they're looking at that to me i think that's the first step right we have to we got to get used to um embracing our community learning from one another learning what has happened um and go from there and of course you know you know, since we work together on my research project, you know, you're obviously going to get a chance to see other things that I'm thinking and saying that are not out right now. But that's how I see the, the future outlook for us. Education. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, may the ancestors continue to guide you and your work. Um, may, may God continue to strengthen you because this is tough work. Because as we are doing this work, we are also uncovering certain wounds, right, in our own lineage. So it's not easy work, um, and I recognize that. So thank you very much for dedicating your time and your energy to, to this because we truly need it. Um, but we'll pick up on this again. Thank you. <laughs>